and thanks everyone for joining. So uh, I'll, we've got the, as Laurel mentioned, we, we got an overwhelming amount of questions, which is, which is wonderful. We'll try to follow up on each one of those. Uh, I've got a list here to start running through. Uh, Doug Dole, and I actually see you're at the top of the list. So I also want to mention that if you've got a question, feel free to start your video. Uh, if you've got a question during one of my questions, feel free to pop into the chat and uh, I'll try to answer and get through as, as much as we can. So uh, Doug, let me read off your question and you can elaborate on it uh, if you want in any way as well. But you asked me to clarify this distinction between risk and debt flow items. So risk would seems to be limited to compliance risks. There are many other types of risks and issues that have potential impact to value streams. Are these other risk types, for example, financial resource, et cetera, classified as debt in the flow framework model? So the, the key thing is, in terms of the flow framework, well, Doug, did you want to elaborate any, or should, should I just dive in? Uh, dive right in, Nick. So the flow, for the whole goal of the flow framework, these flow items, is that all work for a value stream is actually captured by one of the four flow items. So you will have your very rich, and you know, one of my favorite things about the skeletal framework is its taxonomy. It's got a very well-defined, uh, a well-evolved taxonomy. That's, that's evolved over many, over a couple of decades of, of mastering software delivery practices. And the goal of the flow framework is to capture at a more abstract level each of those and to basically be able to take those work item types and put them into the appropriate bucket. So the, now I should also mention, Doug, your question, and so we've had to multiple, I've had heard many people ask, how do we distinguish debt and risk? So it's a fairly common question. The other key thing is, when we've done flow framework deployments, what we've noticed is the things that are always least well categorized at the start are actually debts and risks, right? So uh, you need to get started somewhere, but the bottom line is that at, at a higher level, debts are anything related to tech, you know, basic technical debt, value stream debts, things that are shortcuts where you need to, you, you took a shortcut somewhere, right? You could, you could have taken a shortcut to how you uh, access some data, uh, how you, you know, uh, portion of your deployment model, um, some deployment automation that was never done and is manual. So some testing that's manual, some, you know, basically API that you meant to add, but never did. So some code was copy pasted and so on. So that's all have to do. And Mark, I would actually point you to, uh, there's various work in terms of helping identify that. So Martin Fowler actually has this great quadrant on the four types of technical debt. And it all has to do with something that was known to be done that hopefully made into your, into your backlog. What we always encourage our teams to do is to always basically have a work item type of technical debt that goes onto the backlog when you take that shortcut. So that at the moment that the debt was created, you take it because one thing that's notoriously problematic with technical debt is there's no great way of detecting it or measuring it in the code base after the fact. And the interesting thing with technical debt is this is think beyond the code. So if you've got, let's say, uh, you know, you've deployed two different tools or two different systems, they're not talking together, they're not integrated. Well, that's a kind of value stream debt that you might have. For example, if your requirements are not properly flowing into your agile backlogs, that's actually debt in the automation that you needed in the value stream. If you've got some automation missing in your continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, you should also think of that as debt and you're always you know, taking down that debt. Now, risks, in broad strokes, think everything related to governance, risk and compliance, data privacy, data security, all of that work. So risks are always known up front, or at least can be determined up front. So when we work, for example, with banks, uh, you know, one very large bank, they had over 220 types of risk items going into eight different risk buckets. So these were all completely understood and they were really big controls, some having to do with uh, you know, compliance controls, some security controls, some data privacy controls. So risks should generally be known and under, understood for your specific application domain, right? If it's safety critical software, those are different risks than if you got the di data privacy risks associated with healthcare software. So risks are, should be generally well understood. You know, some new risks can be identified by say, you know, tools that automatically identify risk in a code base or in, in, in a portion of your infrastructure. But there really should be you know, these two distinct, uh, two distinct and separate categories of risks and debts, where debts are something that accrues over time in the code base. Uh, and of course, debt, debts can expose risks. Because if you've taken all these shortcuts, you're not using the latest you know, security framework, uh, your Equifax, and you're still on some ancient version of struts, then, then you're, you're going to expose yourself to additional risks. And some of those risks, maybe the, the security scanning tool will find, uh, the compliance scanning tool will find. So that's basically the, the way to think about it. Doug, any, uh, any further questions on that? 
Does that, does that make sense? So just to paraphrase, if I understand you, uh, debt is, to, is a shortcut. That's basically what we're talking about. Um, can be technical, can be otherwise, you know, impacting the value stream. And risks are things that can be identified up front. You know, in the book, you talk about compliance risk and security risk specifically, but it's not limited to that, right? Is that no, it's not limited to that, but it is limited to the risks associated with things you can fix into the value stream. So you would not think of the, the economic climate as a risk in the value stream, right? That's a risk that's external and that's a market risk, let's say. It's an execution risk. So think of risks as anything that you could actually address and fix in the value stream having to do with the software. So if the software that you release was non-compliant, well, that's a compliance risk work that needs to happen. And this is the key thing with the flow framework is it represents not really what's there in the running software if you take a snapshot of the software, it represents the work that's flowing through the value streams, right? It's, it's those units of work. It's like those cars on the assembly line. So it's good to do, to risk is considered bad in the full framework, it's good to do risk work, right? The more you invest in risk work and in those types of flow items, the less, you know, the less, uh, the safer your software, basically, uh, and the more compliant your software. So, one of the key goals of the flow framework is because what we've noticed, and when we look at organizations' value streams, right, we, we analyze their tools, their JIRA, their Azure DevOps, their, um, their basically where all, the, where all their work is being done. What we're seeing is there's not enough identification of risk work or debt work. And that work is probably happening oftentimes. So when we actually dig in and say, okay, well, why isn't this ever visible on your backlog? Why don't you have a work item type in JIRA? An issue type in JIRA, that's one of the four technical debt types that, say, Fowler uses. It's like, oh, well, we just kind of work on that as we go, right? And the problem that the flow framework addresses is teams and teams of teams need to get credit for the risk and debt work they do, right? This is the, but the big problem is that uh, too often it's only feature work that's appreciated. Uh, and that's in terms of release planning, in terms of you know, PI planning and reviews. And retrospectives, that's what's appreciated notice because that's what's visible to the customer, visible to the business. Defect work, of course, is never seen as positive because it's always fixes. And teams are not basically not getting credit for the technical debt work they do or the risk work they do because it tends not to be visible. So the flow items, one of the main goals, one of the first kind of uh, benefits that you get from a flow framework deployment is that becomes visible and then the teams can actually you know, claim credit for it. It's like, well, you know, this release, we need to do a whole bunch of data privacy work. That means we'll let, do less feature work. Let's celebrate the data privacy work that, that we managed to get done because that is important to the business. I had this, you know, this great, ex this really interesting experience. Uh, and this was uh, two months ago doing a, an executive review. I'll often do these executive reviews to, to help understand the flow metrics that we're seeing at different organizations. And what had happened is for the CEO, had said the CEO was, uh, had a lead manufacturing background, right? So the CEO kind of understood this concept of, of debt and, and deeply understood this concept of, of products and value streams. And so he said, well, we decided six months ago that technical debt, and we, we reviewed our architecture and so on, that this was a significant problem in our organization. And so where is that work? Why is it still, why are we, you know, he was actually looking at, at the different flow metrics charts and, you know, we tend to color the technical debt thing purple. There was, not, there was not any purple. And the team said, well, we still have to catch up an instance. We still have to do the feature work. We're still not getting to the tech debt work. Meanwhile, you know, they, of course, wanted to do that. But sort of, it, you know, in, in the middle product management layer, there was still a need to get those features done. And this helped realign that middle layer saying, no, no, that, that work that, that, you know, always seems like a vitamin and is never, is never getting prioritized. At a business level, we care about that. We don't want to get to the point where we're on a burning platform where it gets very difficult or we expose ourselves in, in ways, in different ways because we're still working on these very old technologies. So a really big part of it is to elevate these two things that in typical agile workflows get underappreciated, make them visible, and then prioritize them in your PI planning. And be very deliberate about saying, okay, this particular release cycle, we're going to do this much work on basically invest this much in technical debt reduction. And this is how much work, risk work we have to do. Because the risk stuff is generally fixed. It just needs to be visible to be a visible trade-off, so. So can I just beat this dead horse to death on one, one more sure. thing? Sure, this, this, this is a key one, absolutely. So 
risk, I think you covered it, but I want to make sure I understand. Debt I'm, debt I'm good with. Risk to what? Is it risk to the product, risk to the value stream, risk to what? Because there's any number of risks, right? And as you said, some of it doesn't really belong in, in this context. So how would you clarify that? What is it when we're looking for this risk, risk to what? Yeah, so great. So the answer is always risk to the product, but there's different layers of product just to keep this simple. So it's risk to the product. So let's say it's a, it's a customer facing product. The, the risk might be that the customer's data could be overly easily breached. The risk might be that it doesn't, this particular financial services product doesn't follow some you know, money laundering controls that it needs to and so on. So the risks tend to be specified and it's the risk to the product. But what we say is uh, you need to treat your value stream itself, your value stream network as a product, right? The, the way that you actually deliver software, the factory itself is a product, right? When we look at a uh, a modern car company's software portfolio, there's car software, that's one product domain, there's plant software, that's another really important product domain because it helps them build cars or it enables them to build cars. So think of value, your value streams as a product and you could have risk in your value stream. So just as an example, uh, the way we think about risk in our, in, in our value stream network product, so we're actually pipeline itself as a product, is if we're consuming open source licenses without automatic checking for those licenses for, for our own compliance rules, well, that's a risk that we're, we're exposing in our value stream network. So maybe there were some shortcuts taken, um, maybe some things were patched up. Um, and so we really wanna reduce that risk and we wanna invest in, uh, auto, well, we've done this ages ago, years ago, but automated license checking for open source so that a, a build breaks if someone commits some code uh, that had the wrong kind of like, you know, LGPL or GPL license in it. So, so think of your, the, the way that you, it's a great question. And the way, I think that the simplest way we, we found to think about it is just think of your value streams themselves and your value stream network, your, 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 your tool network um, as a product. And then you'll reduce risks in that product itself. You'll need, you, you bake compliance into the pipeline itself. And once you do that, it's great because you're, you know, by virtue of doing that, reducing any of those kinds of risks, like introducing open source compliance issues across all your say customer facing products as well. And also, you know, also keep in mind debt in the pipeline, as I mentioned before, right? If something's not connected, you've got a manual process, that's a, that's a debt in your tool network and you want to re resolve that debt. So. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Great question. All right. So next question. I love the idea of oh, uh, the name. So this is um, from Osman Beg. I, I work in product management, very little influence on the software delivery for application on software delivery for application development teams. How can I influence teams and management to start seeing value from digitizing their value streams by applying value stream management? Look for, and uh, Osman would like some more insight beyond start small, show quick wins, measure and show results. So yeah, I think it, it, it's been interesting. A lot of these conferences, especially the last part of that question, you know, we hear that a lot, start small, experiment, you'll get there. Uh, but when, you, when you've got some organizational silos that don't actually give you this kind of view, I, I, completely, I completely empathize that this, this actually becomes uh, a significant problem. So what will often happen is that the organization, and actually most, organize, most large enterprise organizations start from this context, is that there'll be very significant silos. So the value stream will be just completely decomposed in, to people working on the um, let's say the, the business side of things and design and business analysis and requirements and so on, the development side of things, um, and then to first operations and, uh, and actually running the software and supporting the software. And the point of value streams is to break through those silos because you don't have a value stream if you're looking at those three silos. So what we actually want is this end-to-end this -end flow across the value stream because what you'll notice is if you've got no influence over let's say the flow distribution, because by the time it gets to you, it, it's been said and done, you're not actually able to properly con contribute to that, to properly help increase things like, like the flow efficiency or, or the flow velocity. So the way I would break through this is to say, you know, you, you, the bottom line is, is use the flow framework as a way to break through those silos. So basically say, if you're part of value stream, you're, you're part of operating the software, uh, what you need is to be able to look at a common view. And part of the problem that we're seeing is that a lot of organizations will basically, you know, the operations team won't be part of the PI planning, the release planning, 
right? So one thing obviously you can leverage and, and, and save is okay, bring more people to the table for PI planning and use that. But then that's on its own usually not enough. What you'll actually need to do is start looking at a common set of metrics, right? If, if the operations team is only looking at their DevOps telemetry incidents uh, and so on, uh, and the agile team is always just looking at their burn down charts, you're not seeing this common view and you're not really you know, playing the same game. And so what we always encourage is have, be looking, first of all, connect those silos. You, you have to connect those silos. If you're not, basically, if incidents are not becoming defects on the backlog, uh, if you don't have that, basically, that flow of information back and forth between development and operations, you, you're not going after the three ways of DevOps. And teams do this different ways. They'll try to make a common backlog view in a single tool, or you can integrate the tools because chances are like, you know, the ops team has a very different need in terms of meeting SLAs, while the dev team has a very different need in terms of having very effective boards and, and roadmap planning tools uh, that they use. So what you want to do is, first of all, you know, break through those silos, both at an organization level, where what you get out of safe, such as PI plan, lets you do that, right? It, it breaks through those silos and creates the right kind of meeting structure and the right communication structure breaks through them at the tool level. So connect the tools uh, and so that you have, and that's the whole point of the bottom of the flow framework. You need to have a connected tool network, network at the bottom. So you have a connected value stream network in the end. So information's flowing. And then the key thing is you need a process of continual improvement where you, multiple sides, the different, the, the different silos, because again, the silos are not, not going away overnight. They're looking at the same information on how to improve. So just an, as an example, uh, with the flow metrics, one of the really interesting things that we saw it, that you can see is where work is queuing up. And fundamentally, with the flow framework, one of the main things it's about is helping you measure your value streams. So basically, model your value streams, then measure them, then find the bottlenecks. So what we saw in one case is that, and I'll give you just a couple different cases of where you can actually see, when you see work queuing up in silos, it, it creates a very different kind of conversation. Uh, that people have in terms of working together to break through those silos. So one example is we saw a team working in, uh, this team was actually working in, in the plan view tool and creating all of these great you know, user stories and ideas and requirements for development to implement. Then they were basically getting manually entered into, in this case, in the case of this organization, it was into JIRA, right? And all these stories were being left as draft in JIRA Development was nowhere near done what they were supposed to be working on previously, but because there was no common communication, both at the sort of at the planning level or at actually the visibility level, all of these things were just always being left in draft. And you saw this huge queue, which shows up on the value stream as flow load. So you see this huge queue of user stories that in the current way of working will not get started for six months and will not get finished for another 12 months. So this way of looking at it just, just doesn't make sense. But if you start looking at where that work is queuing up, you'll see that if these teams are not talking and if these things are not implementing PI, you know, some form of PI planning, uh, they'll never get through this, right? Because one team is just generating all this work. The other team's context is completely different. Uh, or the value should say the other silos context. The silo of development is completely different. And there's, there's basically no flow. So this will show up almost instantly in your flow load metrics and in, in where you're seeing your bottlenecks because things get queued up. And a really similar thing, of course, can happen if code is not getting deployed quickly enough. Because development teams, if you're using the flow framework correctly, you're always basically making, you, you make sure that the flow states on the flow items are end to end, which means a user story is not done until it's deployed. And if it's being marked as done until it's deployed, it's, 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 it's not actually done. You need a different workflow, workflow state to that. So if deployment's too slow, you'll again see this massive queue forming of stories that should have been closed but weren't, and you'll start asking the right questions. Maybe there's some underinvestment on the infrastructure side. Maybe some project to, you know, to deploy a, a private cloud or a hybrid cloud um, went too slowly and things are queuing up there. And of course, the key thing is that it allows you to understand where to invest at an organization level and the communication architecture level, like for example, making sure people are talking uh, on the same page, and potentially at a resource level. Because if your infrastructure is not keeping up with the pace of your development, well, chances are you need to deploy some resources there. So, all right. So I will go. Uh, there's another question that came in here. Oh, and thank you, uh, Suki, for posting that uh, Martin Fowler technical debt quadrant. Yeah, I think that's 
that's if, if you to new and I think adapt that to how your teams like to think about it. But the key thing is always make sure that technical debt work is visible. And this is a, a nice catalyst uh, to helping with that. Okay, so do you estimate risk to help in planning and understanding how much risk accumulates over a period of time? So the answer to that, that's a great question. And the answer to that is yes. So the way that we approach it is that in the way that we do PI planning and release planning is we always look at, we not only look at the work being done. So, you know, we want these business epics, these features done, and we want to make progress here. We always have a, a, another part for each product value stream. So we do the reviews for each product value stream, unsurprisingly. Uh, and for each product value stream, we also add a review of the flow distribution and we look at what the flow trends are as well so that we're realistic. So we look back and forward in terms of the flow metrics and the release, release review. So we will, for example, see if we've been doing, in this, if, if the release work has been low, for the last two releases, well, guess what? On this particular value stream, and it's, it's quite a bit lower than the other value streams, you know, what's going on here? Maybe this is a new product that we're working on, and chances are, as it starts getting, gaining more adoption, that risk book will need to catch up as it you know, goes from being, a, let's say, a beta into a, um, into a generally available product and so on. We'll, we'll see trends over here in this other product value stream. Well, if their risk work on the last releases has had a lot of technical debt work, we expect that investment in technical debt to turn into much faster feature velocity. So presumably the, the, the product manager for that value stream would then say, okay, well in this release, we can actually assume we'll have more feature velocity than last release because why else would we have been working on the tech debt? And we don't, we're not looking for the same feature uh, velocity this release, we're looking at increasing that feature velocity. Uh, and then what we also do is each in, in the release planning, each of, uh, each of the business epics that's reviewed is reviewed in terms of the type of flow item that it supports. So if there's, you know, if we're, if we're deploying a major new authentication framework or single sign-in or something, well, of course, we're, we're doing that uh, in order to say, you know, reduce risk over here. So to answer your question, there'll be a significant investment um, in, in risk and compliance for that and so on. So yeah, exactly. So just, it, it's, it's actually, it's, I find it so easy and so effective to incorporate the flow items. And we've been doing this, you know, we've, we've had the opportunity of doing this for years now into the release planning itself so that your conversations, especially with the business counterparts who say, well, why, why are we not getting these features done this quarter when we've got this massive backlog and we've had it for ages? Uh, you just get on the same page in, in, in terms of discussion of how to accelerate delivery over multiple releases, not just over this one. And of course, that historical information that's so valuable in terms of, well, here's our investment profile from the last, let's say one or two, uh, and here's how that's affecting our, what we can deliver in this release, so. All right, so a uh, question from Dale we uh, Wegener. So for a company within an industry that's been decimated due to COVID-19 and has had significant staff reductions while we're transforming, what do you think are the highest priority elements uh, that we need to focus on. Okay, so that's, you know, I think that's a, a key question for these times. I think the main thing, and I've, I've personally been able to work with some companies who've had major, major business disruptions and business model disruptions uh, due to the pandemic. So to say in the travel industry, uh, the airline industry. Now, the number one thing that I would do in this scenario is basically to quickly get to the point of understanding your product portfolio and to really understand it from two different angles. So one angle is the business landscape aspect of it, right? The flow framework doesn't help you any on that. So you just need to understand, you know, we've had this cash cow, it's no longer a cash cow, let's say, right? We see revenues in this decreasing. Uh, here's what we're seeing from the market. Uh, here's another part of our portfolio, maybe some digital platform where we actually think there's promise. So even in the post-COVID world, this part at a business level, at a market level, uh, we see that there's, there's promise in this thing increasing. We're not sure yet maybe, but we, we need to test that out. So that's already happening. Every, I think every business out there has been doing these kinds of things for, for the last three months uh, and that, that needs to continue. And now the key thing is that you need to match up that view that you have of market attractiveness with your ability to execute technically. 
So you'll have aspects of your, let's, let's just uh, take an example where you might have a, a cash cow that's shrinking slowly, right? So if that cash cow is, is shrinking slowly, you probably don't want to pile massive resources into it to build a whole bunch of features. You want to sustain it. You want to make sure the quality uh, remains. You want to make sure that it's, 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 it continues to be easy for customers to adopt, but you're not going to invest in it tremendously. Meanwhile, if you've got some new, very promising thing that you'll think will work for this po in the post-COVID world, uh, some new digital part of your platform, you might want to double down on that, right? Uh, the business might want to double down on that. But then you need your ability of, to execute on that is proportional to your ability to basically take dollars and turn them into flow, turn them into delivery on the value stream. So you need to understand the, you know, and this is the, the way we approach it, the flow metrics for that particular part of the product portfolio. Because the biggest problem that let's, let's just say that the flow metrics for that product showed that there's been, it's, it's very promising, it's very new, but what's been happening is the teams have been developing features like crazy and they've done none of the compliance and risk work, right? And there's tons of technical debt. And this is the way we've personally, like in many products I've done, when we're experimenting with products and we're seeing if there's some kind of market fit, we do this, right? We don't wanna do a whole bunch of tech debt work. We just wanna build a whole bunch of features, see how well they work. And then if we're getting a good market response, then start doing some of that hardening, um, some of those, some of that work that's, that's gonna make this thing easier to scale and perform and, and so on. So if you don't, you need that view, that basically that technical view on your product portfolio so that you know if you're gonna pour R&D dollars into it, is it really going to be ready? Will those dollars turn into the next set of features in a meaningful time frame? And so the flow metrics provide you with this, this, these metrics for your ability to execute on that part of your product portfolio. So you can set the business's expectations accordingly. And in some cases say, well, we actually need six months. We've, put, we've brought on piles of technical debt. Yes, we think this thing's the future, but if we don't have to take the six months or let's say double up on the resources that we thought we needed, and of course give them the ramp time to actually do this, we're not gonna be able to execute the way that the board envisions, right? The, the, way, the way our CEO envisions, because we've just not invested in those kinds of flow items on this particular product value stream. Uh, so the main thing I see is basically connect up your, what you've got already. But, well, so number one, you need to understand your product portfolio. It needs to be defined, right? Oftentimes we'll say, you know, when we're working with very large organizations, we'll say, okay, don't boil the ocean because you don't need to understand your end-to-end -end product portfolio today. Just start measuring parts of it, build it out incrementally, you know, have some kind of view of it, and then actually use the flow metrics to determine what the products are, what the sub products are and so on, what your product domains are, right? And just, and just do this incrementally and refine your product portfolio model every quarter. Uh, in this scenario where you've got say an existential risk due to COVID or you've got major problems due to COVID, actually go ahead and boil the ocean quickly, right? The, the quicker you boil the ocean, the quicker you've got a view on your portfolio, the quicker you'll know how to rebalance your effort into the things that are going to deliver you the, the most future dollars, and then how to basically pull back from the previous things. Because you could, let's say, have a replatforming effort underway on your cash cow. You might need to kill that immediately because it's not gonna give you enough future dollars. So you, there's no point investing in massive tech debt reductions in a cash cow that's shrinking. You wanna redeploy those dollars to the new thing or the, the set of new things that'll, that'll help you thrive. Uh, and, but you need to also do that while measuring your ability to execute you know every month when when you're in this in, in this kind of mode you should be looking at the metrics at a leadership level every single month right it's it's not enough to do it as part of pi planning you need to see how did we do th this month in terms of making sure that we can put, rebalance and move further dollars into this promising new product line uh and turn that into value and turn that into something competitive and relevant in the market so so basically quickly assess your product portfolio and do it the way you've always been doing it, which is with the business and market metrics, and then combine that with the flow metrics, which will show you your ability to execute into that. So, uh, there's another question that just came up or a couple other questions, let me bring them up. What is your definition of product? Uh, output of IT production, component, artifact application with value, service or customer. So the definition of product always has a customer because in the flow framework as in lean manufacturing, products are always about pull. So someone has to pull the value. 
And uh, th that means that it has to have a customer. That customer can be external. So it can be an, 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 a customer in the market. It can be a segment of the market. That customer could be internal. So you could have a product that's an API that's provided, that's consumed by multiple external facing product, business facing products. And that API, the way that you measure its business results portion of the flow framework is through, let's say, adoption of the API. So there has to be a customer, the customer has to be meaningful and a product is never, so a product can be a service, it can be a shared service as long as you've got customers identified in the organization and as long as you know that you can measure the adoption of those customers. So it can be this tiny small component over here because that won't be meaningful to let's say these different business products that are trying to build off this, this common platform component, this, this common set of APIs. So customer, meaningful, and by virtue then, they'll actually span different functions, different artifacts, uh, different components in the software. Now, again, the way that you define those, because in an organization that's not been product first and, and has not had a product operating model, there can be, let's say, you can end up, I've seen this, right? I've seen 800 applications that are separate 1,200 services, and do, do you make each one of those a product? And the answer is no. You actually do need to combine those into buckets of products, product value streams. Each product value stream should be supported by between one and 10 agile teams, so that each product value stream is not bigger than a team of teams level. Uh, and then, of course, you'll have dependencies between these. So they, they are bigger buckets than, than individual products and services. And the way that you bucket them uh, is by the customer that you're trying to deliver value to, and that you can actually measure at a investment and results of at a business level. So, all right. So next, uh, another question came in. Do you think that having a comprehensive product model, including detailed decomposition, will be beneficial in controlling the associated value streams? So the answer to that is yes. It's just be careful about boiling the ocean with a product model. So it's okay to start more coarsely. It's okay if you know, not every one of your 600 services is mapped tomorrow. Uh, and don't only, and just be really careful to not only use the software architecture and your, basically your component and services model, also make sure you're using your team structure and defining that, right? Because, you know, like it or not, Conway's law is, and the fact that our software architecture, the products that we produce and the shape and size of our org chart, um, that those, those actually all determine what, what, the, what the product and architecture look like. So it's already, the, in the end, this is all about aligning uh, your team structures, your software architectures to your product portfolio, but it's not something that you do you know, overnight. So uh, just make sure that you're doing it and then you're iterating on it. And then the most important thing you know, that I've seen is that you're iterating on it with data. So you're seeing, okay, we've got these teams producing this over here. They've got great flow. They've got dependencies on these 18 services. Let's take those 18 services and make them one product value stream and actually invest more in that product value stream because we've got multiple external facing, market facing products that depend on all those services. So you just do it iteratively with data rather than trying to do it as a big bang upfront um, enterprise architecture. All right, another question. Oh, Steve Adolf, hi Steve. How would you classify intentional architectural work that will, as Sage puts it, enable future feature work? It is not necessarily playing, paying down debt, rather is intentionally reducing the potential for accumulating debt. So that is a great question. Uh, it's something that we've actually seen, you know, come up a lot as a question. And in the end, what we do right now, so how you define it, so I think there are two approaches to it. That we, that we see as being effective. So one is, and this is the enablers, let's say that you're working on. And I think it's the number one thing is that you're actually paying attention to those. If you're already working, using effectively using that part of safe, that's key, right? Because enablers will make this, this kind of investment explicit. So we see, two, just in practice, we've seen two ways work. First is that let's say that you've got, uh, you know, customer-facing product, 
what I've seen is that the enablers are actually called, the, they, they fall into the debt item, right? They're going to reduce your current or future debt. And one thing that you said, Steve, is so key is the practice that, that we've adopted internally is we won't actually take on, we won't do tech debt work at Passtop unless we see it increasing feature velocity within 12 months. Because the future is uncertain, frameworks and technologies and APIs change and so on, uh, the cloud services that we build on change. So we'd be over optimizing our architecture by not focusing all tech that work on features. And I, would find, I find this tremendously helpful because you stop doing architecture for architecture's sake and you're doing architecture in the way that you described it, Steve, which is you're doing architecture just to reduce future debt piling up and then increase or ease the, uh, the delivery of features, which is why we're always very careful when a bunch of tech that work happens in the value stream that we actually saw after that, because the hypothesis is always, this will speed up feature velocity, that we actually saw that feature velocity improve. Now, there's another aspect to it, which is, and this is this notion of platforms that I think is really important. So if you've got within your, uh, your portfolio, a platform, right? You could do some platform work that will feel like enablers that will actually then make it much more quick for different things building on that platform to deliver and to build up, up less debt. Let's say you've got, I don't know, four different business products, external you know, facing customer products. Each of them has replicated some business logic in terms of getting a specific customer view to know what offering to present to the customer. You really wanna bring that into a, a platform component so that you're not reproducing that in four places. You're doing what Amazon does and it has a part of your platform and it's a recommender engine that any part, any product uh, that Amazon offers can use. So in that case, because this is a platform component that's providing new arch and reusable architecture to all the other products, that work will tend to get tech, uh, categorized as features. So things that feel like enablers are actually features because you're, you're implementing these, these, these net new capabilities that both reduce tech debt and make it easy for all those things building on the platform to build features. So hopefully that helps a bit, but I think the key thing is as long as the teams are having this discussion or categorizing the work, uh, we'll actually see that the work will get recategorized as, as they go because they might think of it slightly differently. But as long as it's being categorized, tagged the right way, you can always you know, reprocess the work if you want to look at a different view of, the da of a dashboard or something and, and see if that other categorization was more effective. But those are the, the two ones I've seen be very effective. And again, uh, key, one of the key things in terms of that, that product orientation is, is thinking of these three separate layers of, of a product portfolio, right? The business and customer facing products, then the APIs and shared services and data pipelines that, that power those, those are the, the, the platform products. And those are key because, you know, say they help reduce tech debt and everything above them. And then the value stream network itself as a product. So this is the factory, the tools, um, the investment in, in, in all the tools and practices uh, and automation that you need to, to deliver above that, so. Here's another question. Uh, how do you, and this is from Tarifa, how do you align enterprise architecture with value streams? And so I think this is, a, this is definitely a, one of a favorite topic of mine because I think it's, it's, it's so important. And the challenge is that enterprise architectures and most of the ones I've seen have evolved from years or decades of technology layers and enterprise architectures being to evolve to better support provide options for making things easier to build in the future. And they've evolved less to support value stream flow. So the, the biggest advice I have there is stop thinking of enterprise architecture as supporting enterprise architecture. Think of enterprise architecture as needing to support the value stream flow. And an example I gave um, to answer Steve Adolph's question of uh, you know, how we think of it at Tastop is that we don't think of enterprise architecture distinctly from flow. And we used to, right? I, I used to I spend a lot of uh, time working in enterprise architecture. I used to think of enterprise architectures as supporting sort of all future possibilities of a product portfolio, leveraging those technology stacks, separating different technology layers, and having as little redundancy and duplication as possible, having as much modularity as possible. And years ago, when I started thinking more in terms of flow and understanding how important this concept is, I realized, well, so if you, let's say you would do, and here was, here was a really interesting, I'll give you an interesting example because there's 
Uh, my friend Jean-Michel, who's now the VP engineering at Shopify, but previously he was VP engineering at Atlassian. And he said to me many years ago, something that, that, that really changed my, my thinking on this. And he said, uh, we're gonna fork Jira. We're gonna have a Jira cloud version and we're gonna have a Jira on-prem version and we're gonna make them two separate code bases. And that, as from an enterprise architecture point of view, that, that just blew my mind. I thought that was, I said, you know, what, what, you know, what are you doing? Why on earth would you do that? You just like, you know, I've been talking and working around modular any mechanisms for a decade and you're gonna, you're gonna go against everything that we think we know as well. It's, it's just gonna increase flow. We have different flow requirements in terms of the, the kinds of things that we're delivering on-prem versus the kind of things we're delivering in cloud. Um, we have different kind of plugin ecosystems that we want to support. So yeah, this is a big duplication, but it's going to make those both value streams go faster. And it's sort of similar to what we saw with people building separate uh, software stacks, let's say for Android and iOS, because they, they could never get a good enough modular experience for a native platform, but they could if they separate the value streams. And what those organizations realized is, if they optimize, if you optimize for technology, you would never, you know, you would, you would never, be, you would always have a single platform, right? Because you want as little duplication as possible. If you optimize for product value and flow and for customer experience, well, then you could quickly end up in a decision that no, we want a native iOS and a native Android experience, as so many organizations realized. And so that's the key thing: is that think flow, customer, and product value stream first, and then have that define your architecture because you'll make fundamentally different enterprise architecture decisions if you think in terms of flow and things that seem like duplication or wrong decisions will actually be the right decisions when you realize that they actually maximize the customer experience in certain ways so yeah that was a, a very uh, interesting and enlightening uh, learning for me personally so all right next question uh from suki safe has an implementation roadmap, which is freely available and based on what works, what didn't work over the years. Is there anything equivalent for the flow frame in terms of implementation steps? So yes, first of all, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the safe implementation roadmap. I find it extremely effective. Uh, I'll just be blunt and say with the flow framework, we haven't created something quite as effective as the safe implementation roadmap. We have one. So in terms of, and it's basically the, it, it, it separates into three different steps. So when we, uh, when we, our partners and others, we at TASTAP, I mean, um, our partners, uh, such as you know, organizations like C-Prime and others are helping organizations implement the flow framework and almost and very commonly implement the, the flow framework with SAFE. What we're seeing, what we're doing is we have this step in terms of learning to see because there's never been this level of visibility before. So it's learning to see, uh, then it's, then it's learning to improve and then it's learning to scale. So you've got these, these three different steps. We often see organizations that wanna say improve using the flow metrics in month two. It's, it's quite easy uh, if you've got the right kind of infrastructure to get the flow metrics out of your value streams, even at scale, but you won't have the baseline to know how to improve. You actually need that baseline. So in the first step of the roadmap, you first need to learn to see and you, you, you want uh, weeks and ideally, let's say a, a releases worth of data to see where the bottlenecks are. Because so often the assumptions that you've been making around how to improve are based on, you know, on, on opinions, are based on basically small segments of the value streams that lead to local optimization of the value stream, but you're finally getting that end-to-end -end data. So you're seeing, oh, wow, the bottleneck is really further upstream than we thought. That's where things are really queuing up, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's not actually on the dev team where, 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 we, where we think work is waiting, it's upstream of the development teams and so on. So learn to see, then with that data, you start getting into, and this is the whole point of the flow framework because it's in the end, it's a measurement framework. Um, you start, it's not a methodology framework like SAFE, which is why these things dovetail so nicely. You're able to measure your deployment of SAFE. So what's happening is then you go into this learning to improve phase where you're using the data to do data-driven continuous improvement. So, and with that, once you've got that done for a few value streams, then the third step is learning to scale. So you learned how to deploy this, let's say to now you know, 10 or 20,000 uh, different, different IT practitioners across teams. But the thing I would also uh, keep in mind is in the end, what we're trying to do is give you a measurement framework for your deployment of the safe roadmap, right? You're deploying the safe roadmap, you're scaling it, just use the flow framework to measure how that's going. 
Because in the end, what you're trying to do is set up those value streams, you're trying to increase flow, all that methodology, that practice is baked into safe. And you're just using the flow framework to see is our safe deployment going like we think it is, or do we have some organizational bottlenecks that are not allowing us to get to the vision of safe? And the other key thing I've learned from very large uh, safe deployments is you don't want to fall, and th this is something that, that Dean and I talked about, the potential failure modes of safe. You don't want to fall into the trap of only measuring ceremonies, right? The fact that you're doing peer planning and have arts, that's not success with safe. Success with safe is that those, those value streams in safe, they're delivering more, they're delivering more quickly. So really you're just using the full framework to measure your success with safe. Now, because the point of the full frame takes some time, we've got this point to see, learn to improve it and, and learn to scale. But really think of it as a measurement framework, framework for your safe deployment. So. Thank you. Thanks, mate. My pleasure. All right, let me grab another one of these questions. Uh, as a leader of an operations group centered around application platforms and databases, I'm curious why there's very little discussion about the adoption of the flow framework for non-dev teams. In my own organization, it is an uphill climb to prove that an agile approach, including Scrum, can benefit everyone with some tweaks. Do you find, as you visit other companies, that this is a similar challenge? And if so, how do you recommend they attack the problem? So I see sort of two ways of interpreting this question. One is, uh, you know, one is that you can apply agile practices outside of software development and get good results, right? And I think we've, many of us have seen bits and pieces of that. Uh, and different types of teams in the organization that have nothing to do with software. So the, I, I would at this stage just say, apply those agile practices. The flow framework is really so, it was in terms of how I built it out and designed it and, and proved it out with data and so on. Uh, I was, you know, not, I was a hundred percent focused on using it for software and mix software and hardware and 0% on other business functions. So maybe it applies uh, just like some of the agile practices apply and Scrum applies, but uh, I think it's too early to say, first of all. I think the bigger thing is that these product value streams using the flow framework, they're, they're bigger than development, right? They, they have to span to other business functions, including upstream business functions, such as you know, business planning, uh, financial aspects of funding, software development work, ideation, design thinking, and so on, right? Those are the key additions in Safe 50 that I'm very excited about because in the end, the full framework is about enabling business agility for software portfolios and for software investment. So that is part of the Safe 50 business agility. And basically the full framework doesn't, it's, it's really meant to give everyone a common lens across the very different, the different business functions that form a value stream that in the end produces a digital or a software offering. But in terms of applying it, and I, it's, it's actually been really neat because I have been getting a bunch of messages on LinkedIn and elsewhere of people trying out flow framework uh, concepts for other aspects. You know, most recently someone actually deployed it for a, a pure manufacturing operation, which I thought was, was kind of interesting and circular given a lot of what I learned about this it came from manufacturing. But, but really, it's, it's intended for software. Uh, it's, it, it works for software. And yeah, over time, you know, aspects of it, I'm sure, can be applied to different kinds of work, just, just as other agile practices. But, but really, it's, it's, it's for measuring how you're doing uh, and how to optimize these and manage these value streams that it's so useful for. So uh, another question from Tarifa. Do you go about creating your product roadmap and then developing the value stream Orgs are struggling with what comes first. Okay, so it's, that depends on your context. So we, in the end, you've got some kind of, your product roadmaps and your value streams need to align. So the pro product roadmaps, so the way we do it and the way uh, organizing, you know, many tech companies do it is the product roadmaps are just segmented by each product value stream. And it's that simple, right? So for us, it's very simple. Uh, what gets more difficult is if you've got these existing roadmaps and you don't yet have a clear definition of value stream, you get into that same issue as we saw before with say the enterprise, the different service, shared services that you've got, not quite, and the applications that you've got, not quite aligned into product value streams. So I'd say use your product roadmaps. So A, if you've got product roadmaps, that's great, right? The, the way that we do planning is each product value stream has its own product roadmap and there's an overall roadmap that ties them together. Right? In the end, it, it need, you, you want to get to something that simple. Uh, so use your product road mapping as a way to help identify what the product value streams are. 
because your product roadmap, you know, that, that supports your product strategy and your business strategy, it actually determines the value that you're delivering to customers. And I, as I mentioned before, these product value streams are just about allowing customers to pull value from you. So th they are a great way to define the boundary of those, what those product value streams are. And I would go one step further than to say, use your product roadmaps to define your value streams, to, to bias how they're structured more heavily than your existing enterprise architecture or more heavily than your existing application portfolio. Because product, that, that's, that's what product thinking is. You're thinking about how those value streams deliver value through a roadmap and through how they evolve. So, all right, there's another question here. Um, Let's see, are any of the metrics that you propose, uh, and this is, sorry, this question is from Kevin Stringer. Are any of the metrics you propose considered to be controversial? For example, can be gamed or introduce unintended consequences? If so, how do you suggest approaching these and responding to the best outcomes? So yes, um, one of the, I had, I had a couple dozen of, of um, my closest colleagues review uh, the flow framework and I actually specifically asked them some of these questions is can you tell me how you think these will be gamed how you think the flow metrics will be gamed and of course I had some ideas of my own so I think any metrics we need to assume they will be gamed right that's 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 what happens with metrics and the flow metrics and the flow framework they're, they're what's built into them is that gaming, the, uh, the nature of gaming is that value streams and teams will create smaller flow items to make their flow item counts go higher. Because whenever you have a metric called velocity, well, guess what? There's a perception that more velocity is good. And of course, this is, this is built into the flow framework. So what happens is that the gaming, and this is where the gaming is meant to be healthy, the gaming of the flow framework produces smaller batch sizes. So you're getting more work closed more quickly and that work is getting smaller and smaller. So what will happen is when it get, if it gets too small, so let's say people start making features that are just completely meaningless, right? This, the, uh, this feature fix is, is, you know, what did it really add? It'll start coming up in your review meetings because a, a business stakeholder, a customer stakeholder, someone in that PI planning cycle will go, well, this is not really a feature. No one cares about one, you know, one button on a screen, right? So, so, but it's really, the gaming is built into how the, the, the problem that I saw looking at our own data, our customer's data, is that batch sizes were too big, right? That the business epics would take three release cycles to complete and all these kinds of things. And, and really with large features and epics, that's a, it is a significant problem that I, I always see teams, teams struggle with. So I actually uh, encourage the gaming of making those, those batch sizes smaller, each of the flow items smaller, so that it can always be completed, you know, ideally in a sprint and, and at least in a release. So to support that gaming. And then the only thing to watch, to, to be very careful about is using the metrics to compare different product value streams. So we, for example, will compare, we won't compare flow velocities because the context for different teams can be so different, right? One team can be working on a new hyper-productive stack with the latest technologies. Another team can be working with some, some older backend systems, um, some older database and uh, database systems and so on. And so their flow velocity will be slower and that's okay. What you actually wanna do is make sure that the flow velocity and the flow efficiency is increasing across teams rather than comparing, the, than comparing teams uh, one against the other in terms of their actual flow velocity numbers or their flow time numbers. So, but that, and that's, that's really why flow efficiency is there because it does allow you to say, okay, we want, we want to increase flow efficiency across our value streams. So, or we want a 20% increase per person in, uh, in flow velocity in the value stream, not an absolute value. So, and I actually think those targets for the flow metrics are really important and they are really effective. So. So there's one here from Kurt Katoga. Um, a good one and a half years after presenting your thoughts from project to product, what would you like to add or adjust now uh, to the book besides mentioning coronavirus as the turning point? Yes, yeah, I, uh, as soon as coronavirus it started becoming clear what it was, I, uh, I was talking to Carla Perez nonstop um, about, about is, you know, this, this looks like it's what you predicted back in 2002, is it? And, and I, I spoke, she and I finally believe that it is. So the, 
you know, what's happened really over the last 18 months, and to me, this is the concept of Gemba, right? Of, of, of going to, to where the work is and understanding it. And the biggest thing from the last 18 months is that I've had the, and I'm just thrilled about this, I've had the opportunity to see organizations, just their numbers, basically, you know, I'm a big believer that software is now complex enough that we can't go to Gemba uh, without actually having some kind of notion of, of metrics and measurement that's more abstract than the data that we see in the Agile tool, that's more end-to-end, -end, and that's what the flow framework is meant to do. And that's not just someone's opinion in terms of how things are going or where the bottlenecks are, that actually is a measurement of the system. So for the last, for the last 18 months, I've just been so thrilled to see that real data, the actual data that's flowing in these value streams and what's happening uh, within these flow metrics. I think in terms of the flow framework itself, there are, and of course, we'll continue evolving it. There's no, two, there's no massive 2.0 changes coming. It's actually been representative enough in terms of what's happening there and what's happening in these, values, in these product value streams, right? Um, there's no, uh, there's no you know, fifth flow item coming. And I've had lengthy conversations with many people since publishing the book, with people like Dean uh, Leffingwell before publishing the book to make sure I didn't miss some work item type that he hidden and the framework team had hidden somewhere and saved that, that I couldn't account for. So the biggest thing I wish I'd done more of, and I'm going to try to do more of, is to help organi organizations structure these product portfolios. So I mentioned those different layers, like you've got the business external customer facing products, you've got the platforms and shared services, then you've got the value stream network itself. Um, that was really muted in the book. And I think what's What's happened in some problematic deployments of the flow framework I've seen is, is everything's turned into a business product and it's just not like that, right? We've got these different layers, different types of products and we need, when we actually measure flow, we need to see that we need to invest more heavily in the platform products, more heavily in our agile tool chains, um, in our DevOps tool chains and so on to, to make everything go faster. So the thing I've really been emphasizing is the structure your product portfolio, not as this flat thing, but it's got its own architecture and layers of dependencies. And you all, you know, I, to me, I, I didn't realize, uh, you know, you know I, I, my thinking like this, like many tech companies was you always do that, right? You always have different platform products from business products. You need to invest heavily in your platform products. So I, I wish I'd put more into the book on that. And so we're doing more work to, to make that easier and to really help structure and define those product portfolios as part of your, you know, your, your, your safe implementation roadmap. So you quickly start measuring the right things rather than you know, keep continuing to keep the, the APIs and platforms off to the side and say, oh, we'll deal with those in a year when, when, when we're further in the safe implementation roadmap. And that's just wrong. You, you need your arts. You need road, and here's another key thing, the roadmaps question. You need a roadmap for every single internal product that you have, right? They need to have a backlog and their backlogs are populated by the different business and customer facing products as well. And then that's when you get to this, to this really uh, high effectiveness in terms of your delivery machine because everything starts moving faster when you're making those platform investments. So, so you just make sure you measure, you define those, you model those, and you get the full metrics of those as well. So thanks for the great questions. Looking forward to more of this.